Ozark Bone Reapers. Part 1. Propaganda. Order and chaos, look how they toil. Generations of servants and subjects, losing and reconquering the same stretches of territory, back and forth as the years move on. This one has a mighty hammerhall banner flapping proudly in the wind, which replaced a cornate brass star centuries past, which itself had overrun a golden age cityscape before that which kicked out prehistoric beastmen and toppled their herdstone before the Age of Myth. Nagash wondered if they all unwittingly used the same flagpole. The mortal races of order, the demons of chaos, the mindless berserkers of destruction. In the end, only good for making corpses. And that's where we come in. Welcome to the Ozark Bone Reapers faction focus. Nagash is the supreme necromancer and the god of death in all eight realms. Of course, he raises and controls endless legions of your typical mindless undead, and his necroquake tapped into the spirit worlds as well, which we'll get to in the Night Haunt and Legion of Grief video. But this most recent army, which also happens to be his longest in the making, is going for quality over quantity. Each soldier assembled by the Mortesians of Gothazar, from petrified dinosaur bones, ivory soul dust, null stone, and the ancient remains of dozens of warriors into one. Their souls are just as gestalt as their bodies, keeping and combining all the valor, experience, skill, and discipline they had in life, while discarding irrelevancies like emotion and fear. Nagash often leads his armies personally, via Avatar, unlike the Chaos Gods, who are too bloated and bickering to set foot in another world, or Sigmar, rightly diminished into an overseer role after losing too many fights in person, Alariel sometimes takes part in battle, but she isn't really cut out for fighting, clearly, and Nagash sometimes wonders if she's even really a god at all. Maybe just a demigod after the rebirth. His avatars are not limitless, however, so who can lead his Oziark Bone Reapers on their campaigns of conquest? In other words, who can be his fifth Mortark? As he pondered this question, his necroquake split open the storm vaults, and ancient treasures and foes of Sigmar were released into the realms. The soul of his greatest warlord was freed, killed but not destroyed by Sigmar's own hand in ages past. A genius tactician even in his mortal life, empowered by undeath, and a military history unmarred by defeat, save one, as is so often the case, right there at the end. Nagash built him a body by his own hands, and fashioned his soul into an even mightier weapon than he had been in life, or later in unlife. He let him keep independence, personality, and memories, especially of Sigmar's form and their duel. For a second encounter with the God King, it just wouldn't do if Catacros didn't come out on top. His hatred was only surpassed by his skill, and his skill was only surpassed by his arrogance. Perfection. When not on specific missions, the elite armies of the Ozark Bone Reapers would be the bone collectors of Nagash's forces and the troops independent enough to form treaties, make trade, and generally interact with the other societies before crushing them under heel for failure to comply with ever-increasing demands. Nagash is no slouch of leadership, the lands of Shyish and beyond spare no expense on infrastructure spending. Taxes are spent fairly, and he takes his job as ruler of the underworld very seriously. Souls must be herded and organized in the natural cycle of life and death, evil ones punished, glorious ones rewarded, there's a system to respect here, which is why Sigmar is straight up stealing them for his pedestrian attempts at soul reforging, for Stormcast Eternals is such an insult. First of all, the process is clearly flawed. That much is obvious even to Sigmar's own people. But Nagash thought that Sigmar was the god king of order. Why then disrupt the natural order of life and death? Look, if you can't win against chaos without breaking the rules, then die out as have endless races and peoples before you. The fewer living, the less power chaos will have, after all. There's plenty of room in the underworld, and Nagash takes care of his own. Part 2. Models Elite armored skeletons are your currency here, but let's get to the man in charge. For Catacros, a normal base just would not do, so he comes with a diorama, complete with scroll bearer, spy master, flag holder, and personal bodyguard, the disapproving samurai man. His speed is 4 inches, and he doesn't really start fighting until you've killed most of his retinue, as he sees no reason to personally enter battles unless his opponent proves themselves. He's got 20 wounds and a 3-up save after using his command ability. His other command ability is target unit adds plus 1 attacks with all weapons. He regenerates three troops in three units anywhere on the table in each of your hero faces, has a bunch of great attacks, 
steals a command point from your opponent each turn on a 4-up, and designates one enemy unit on the table to be at minus 1 to hit per turn. And his plus 1 to hit plus 1 armor aura is 36 inch radius at full power. He's a mobile command center and a fine general for the army, though not an auto-include, as he's not a wizard and OBR lists are more diverse than you might think. Beyond battle line, I mean. For that, it's more tech guard every time. But anyway. Arch Cavalos Xantos is a milk-chugging, undead perversion of Sigmar's Lord Akular, with a damage 3 lance on the charge, bonuses against non-death units, and both he and the vanilla version, Liege Cavalos, have 3 up armor and plus 1 attacks with all weapons command ability. Your battle line are Mortech Guard, and are the answer to the question, what if basic skeletons took the Captain America serum? 4 upper rolling armor, exploding hits, 2 attacks a model hitting on 3s with rend, they're just super solid and absorb buffs well. And finally, we have skeletons with some personality. Their big grinning face plates are great. We have Cavalos Death Riders, and they upgrade their movement from the Glacial 4 up of the Mortech Guard to proper mounted 12, though they give up rerolling saves. They keep the exploding 6s, but Lance's proc on 5s. Their command ability gives you impact hits on the charge and an extra 3 inches to pile in with. And they're definitely much more on the anvil side of cavalry than hammer side. But I guess that's not surprising in the big defense army. If you want 12 foot tall Mortech Guard, well too bad, because these don't count as battle lines, so you'll almost never have room for any of them. Which is too bad, because they look really cool. Have good attacks, and their pile-in twice seems really awesome until you read the fine print and realize they can only attack with their shields the second time. Likewise, for the quad-bladed Necropolis Stalkers with great attacks and four heads that hot-swap control depending on what combat style is best for the situation. Rerolling either hits, wounds, saves, or upping rend and damage by one. They can also reroll runs and charges and pass over terrain as though they had flying. Gothazar Harvesters make nice walking bone factories and will not only regenerate your troops from the raw materials collected on the battlefield, but will also help create some of those resources by pounding people to death with their Ren 2 Soul Crusher bludgeons. Speaking of centerpieces, you can also play an avatar of Nagash himself, though at 880 points he's kind of like Archaon in that the army becomes the god show featuring half of a balanced list tagging along, though he is better than Archaon. 16 wounds, flying generally at 2 up, rerolling 1's armor, ignores mortal wounds on a 4 up, casts and unbinds 8 spells a turn, at plus 3, knows hand of dust which 50-50 slays a model outright, soul stealer that does mortal wounds depending on bravery and heals him, and he knows every spell in the Mortesian's lore and he regens three models in five units anywhere on the battlefield in each of your hero phases. He's a legitimate option for general, and if your battle is taking place in Ulgu, it's probably the most fun you can have in death, next to a ghoul king on royal terrorgeist. Your terrain piece is a huge obelisk, the Bone Tithe Nexus, and in each of your hero phases you can select a punishment for it to levy out onto an enemy unit wholly within 18 including minus one to hit on a four up, can't run and only d6 to charge on a four up, one more to wound on a two up, or minus one to cast an unbind on someone on a two up also within 36. Your foot heroes include the controversial Soul Mason, since he's riding an undead gecko walker from Metal Gear Solid 4, but he has a nice reroll ones to hit spell and he can often cast it more than once per turn. And as always, conversions. A Bone Shaper to regenerate a unit if you want to save some points on Harvesters and need a wizard, or even Vok Martian and Soul Reaper if you don't care how bad they are because they look really cool. Archon the Black also makes an appearance in OBR, and he too is a fine choice for general. He's a 360 point triple caster wizard at plus 2, has a command ability that increases the ranges of your spells by 6 inches for all wizards within 18, regenerates 4 units a turn, and is quite fast with move 16 flying. His normal downside, at least in Legions of Nagash, was that he was very fragile with a 4-up save, and being a named unique hero you can't give him an artifact, but if you put him in Petrifex, at least he has a 3-up. Screaming Skull Catapult is back in the form of Mortec Crawlers, which are expensive and slow, but strong. Their 36-inch range shots are accurate and deal 5 damage per hit, though they have no rend, and you have two once-per-game options for alternate fire. Cauldron of Torment is for horde breaking against low bravery chaff, and Cursed Steel is for one-shotting target enemy model with 2d6 or fewer wounds. Your endless spells are pretty nice. Nightmare Shrieker is a fairly standard d3 mortal wound spell that can choose a hero as its main prey to deal d6 against them, and Bone Tithe Shrieker is a cheap way of getting plus one to hit for everyone against a nearby enemy unit. This range of models is striking and characterful, especially for a skeleton theme, which could normally be kind of boring. You're elite enough not to have a huge amount of work ahead of you number of models-wise, 
easy to learn on for beginners with lots of textures that take to washes and dry brushing well, and impressive dioramas and centerpieces to tackle for masters. Part 3 Playstyle Ozark Bone Reapers are Terminator Counterpunch Supermen, Russian slap fighting champions that were seemingly put on this earth with the sole purpose of teaching other Age of Sigmar players that charge everything and hope the dice roll my way is not supposed to always be the answer. Foolish enemies that carelessly charge across the table will hit a wall and have their bones harvested to build a new overpass in Shyish. You aren't fast, you aren't generally choosing who goes first, and you're not trying to steal games with surprise tricks or gotcha moments. You're here to march forward and cordially oblige your opponents to care about objectives or go extinct. Your allegiance abilities are Deathless Warriors, which all death armies get some version of, which is a 6-up shrug when near a hero, and an OBR also when near a Hecatos, which are the captains of your many units, who are more potent leaders here than in most armies, being comprised of the spirits of several veteran commanders in one body, you're also just immune to Battleshock, for obvious reasons, so players who don't like having to figure out those roles will enjoy that quality of life. Or unlife. Drawback. You cannot spend command points in an OBR army, and so you can't use the default command abilities, nor the special realm-specific ones when using the realms of battle rules, which is a big downside. You'll particularly wish you had access to the reroll charges one, but what you get instead is a system of relentless discipline points. These are basically smaller command abilities that you get more of and are meant to be used more often. Most of your units are missing some key features that other armies might just have on their War Scrolls or Heroes, but in OBR you're supposed to always be using these points to keep them at full power. How many you have is based on what choices you've made in army creation, and so is a build around me system. You get a certain amount per battle round, not per turn, and points don't carry over from previous battle rounds which means the sweet spot is exactly running out each round without wasting extra or getting caught empty-handed. Your one generic command ability is plus three move for target unit. This is pretty good, but most of your army is slow even with this bonus, and using this on every unit will quickly run you entirely out of points on your turn, much less the other half of a battle round. And so careful planning is in order. Your command traits and artifacts are pretty good, and your spell lore is interesting. Arcane Command casts on a 5 and gives you d3 discipline points. You have one that lets your exploding hits work on 5s instead of 6s, or 4s for Lance Cavalry. A spell that gives a 5-up ward against mortal wounds to your battle line. And Protection of Nagash, which gives the caster a 5-up shrug. And if any wounds or mortal wounds get through it, he can teleport and then the spell ends. Speed is your biggest weakness, so it's great to have a teleport. However, it's mostly under your opponent's control whether you get to use it or not since he can just not damage you, which makes it very strong against careless opponents, but weaker against good players, which might describe the entire faction itself. Your mileage may vary. You also get legions, and these are kind of like Cities of Sigmar and Slaves to Darkness sub-factions, but different in a few important ways. First, they are optional, and you can play a vanilla OBR if you'd like. Second, they require you to take a specific command trait and artifact in order to use them, which tend to be on the weaker side, which makes this a cost. However, the extra ability and or command ability you get are usually strong enough that taking a legion is almost certainly the way to go. Noteworthy legions are as follows. Petrofix Elite has arguably the coolest lore, being made from petrified dinosaur bones, and happens to be the most obviously powerful one. Your whole army gets plus one armor. Flat increases to armor is a buff which AOS is generally very stingy with, so army-wide is kind of bonkers. Your command ability is used in the combat phase and gives target unit plus one rend, which is secretly perhaps the better of the two buffs, as defense with no offense is often the road to slow losses and ties. Staly Arc Lords gives all your units run and charge, and your command ability lets them retreat and still charge to refresh their lance bonuses. While slowness is your main weakness, OBR is already on the elite side, and all cavalry OBR shares most of the typical problems with that archetype across many factions like Empty Throne Vanguard, Griff Battalion Hammerhall, or Pigs in a Blanket Iron Jaws. However, it's not just your cavalry that can run and charge, so this is potentially a nice choice. Ivory Host has cool lore, but does nothing at all useful. It gives you a way to hit on twos, which you already had access to elsewhere, and then it comes with downsides anyway, for some reason. And should really just be avoided. It's the Meat Fist Maw tribe of OBR. Null Myriad is extremely resistant to spells and endless spells. Having a 5-up ignore army-wide and a command ability to increase it to a 2-up. This is mostly too niche, 
Though if you're in a meta with lots of Zinch and Seraphon, and you want to completely overcompensate, I suppose you could do this. Crematorians are walking furnaces with burning runes that explode when they die, so never mind about Petrifex having the coolest lore. Whenever a friendly model dies in melee, you deal one mortal wound on a 5-up, which would be super powerful in some massive regiment horde army with 200 plus models, but it's a really minor effect in an elite, hard-to-kill, low model count army like OBR. Their command ability robs people of cover bonuses, but cover is a pretty rare thing to have, so this isn't much. This sub-faction would be so good in Gloomspite Gits or Legions of Nagash, but here it's obviously not doing much. Finally, there's Mortis Praetorians, which is one of the only ones with a decent command trait. D3 extra discipline points. Nice. Their command ability lets you reroll hits against units that charged you, which is quite good on durable OBR guys. This one's comparable to Petrifex, I think, though it does mean that Catacros goes from optional to necessary to get that armor buff. Your battalions are okay, but at least they're nice and cheap. But also, OBR units are kind of expensive, although you do get what you pay for unit-wise in this army. It just means your lists fill up quick. You're durable enough to deal with having a lot of drops, just careful about getting pinned away from objectives. So what does this all mean? Well, you have bedrock, solid troops, and powerful heroes, with a lot of situational buffs to find the right times to use. You're elite and slow, but super hard to kill, have some regeneration, and do good damage. It's creeping doom the army. Part 4, Stats. Offense, B. You have good quality attacks on most of your guys, exploding hits, decent ways of hitting on twos, and generally either Ren 2 and Petrifex or rerolling hits slash charge bonuses in some of the other legions. So your hits are great, but your wounds are pretty much just fours, and guard make up most of your guys. You have few ways to deal mortal wounds, and few ways to really deliver the damage where it needs to go. Your artillery is very feast or famine with no rend but high damage, and against poor armor or the right type of unit they can blast as can some of your heroes. Your big damage units are also your most fragile and the ones that can't be regenerated favorably, so these units are often skipped. If you pick them, it's a classic trade of defense for offense, although you lose more than you gain. Defense S. Petrifex Mortec Guard near Catacros have a 3-up rerolling armor save in combat. 2-ups on your main heroes, a 6-up shrug on most of your men, you're throwing some minus 1 to hits around, and you have a spell to protect against mortals on a 5-up. Adding some limited regeneration makes OBR one of the most durable armies in the game, second only to probably Fire Slayers. Most factions in AOS are generally not taking important Battleshock tests, just due to the nature of Inspiring Presence, but you aren't taking any at all. Not every faction has the damage to actually kill your stuff and come out ahead. Mortal Wounds and Shooting are your Achilles heels as far as defense, as you only get one target with reinforced battle shields, and you only reroll saves in combat. There's a reason Shooting, High Rend, and Mortal Wounds have been staples of list building since the game began. Positioning D+. On average, you're slower than Nurgle, and your teleport is caster only and requires the opponent to help it work. No deep strikes, ambushes, flying, can't reroll charges, and run and charge is stuck in one of the lesser legions. Yours will be a reactive strategy, and your planning ahead will be how to get your opponent to come to you. At least your cavalry has a proper move, and an awkward teleport is better than no teleport, so no Fs here. Mechanics A. Relentless Discipline comes with its pros and cons, but it's a fun mechanic to build for and try to get the most efficient uses out of. Your spells are nice, but not really game-changing, unless playing Nagash, who is expensive enough that it's a wash, though a really fun wash. At the end of the day, most of your mechanics really amount to I can't die and my numbers are good, but your durability is so high that it really does change the way your opponent has to approach the match, which is like one of my definitions for good mechanics, so A. Part 5, Notes and Target Audience List building wise, I'd choose the big general you like the most and build around him. Putting Catacros or Nagash on the table and pushing him around is just tons of fun. Petrifex is strong, but not required, and I think Mortis Praetorians might peak a little higher, but it requires a bit more effort. Your choice of General, Catacros, Nagash, Archon, or a bunch of smaller ones, how much artillery to bring or harvesters to support, and what strategies you can use to bring the fights to you will be your main ways of compensating for your disadvantages against opponents trying to outplay you. Opponents who are not trying to outplay you will generally get clapped. This can be a mixed blessing for the OVR player. On one hand, you're like a boss fight, that the opponent needs to play around your mechanics and not stand in the fire, which might feel a little bit out of your control at times, win or lose, 
But this is an army for commanders who, well, want to be a boss fight because that's sweet. You are death and taxes, and your opponent can try to cheat their way out of either at their own risk. Audible footnote, if the aesthetics aren't for you, but you like the playstyle of elite immortal Spartans, the answer is decisively Fire Slayers, or to a lesser degree a Blight King-centric Nurgle.